A couple months ago, I was asked to make a built-in unit for a bubble tea shop to display their merch and snacks. Of course I said yes because I've never done anything like this before, but I knew working on something this large in my shop and then later have to load it into a van and move through doorways all by myself, I really needed to break this into smaller pieces that are designed in a way so that they could be put together on site quickly and efficiently. I was told a wise man once said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And in my case, that first step was the bar top, which was made by laminating two sheets of three quarter inch ply together. Whenever I'm doing something like this, I always cut one of the boards slightly larger. That way I could just flush everything up using my router after the glue has dried, instead of trying to line everything up during the glue up. To hide and protect those not so beautiful plywood edges, I cut some hard maple strips for the trim. I use miter ends on the trim pieces so there won't be any exposed end grain when everything is done. After making that first miter cut, I use it as reference to mark where to make the cut on the other end before gluing it on. Then I just follow this same method of going back and forth between the bar top and the table saw, taking measurements and cutting each piece to fit. Alright, so while I assemble the steel base that the bar top will attach to, let's look at the model again. By design, the top surface of the bar top will sit flush to the top edge of the French cleat wall. And since I'm using a commercial base that has some unknown tolerances, working on the bar top first allows me to more precisely figure out how tall the bench and the top will need to be. Next, I work on the base cabinets, which I originally designed as one piece, but due to it being much longer than the length of any flat surface I had in the shop, I had to make it into two. This made it much easier to handle around in the shop as well as for delivery and install. And then all the side panels will receive a notch on the bottom corners to make clearances for some half inch thick by six inch tall tile baseboards along the walls that this bench will sit against. The main joinery method for this whole build will be glue and pocket screws. And I drilled lots and lots and lots of pocket holes along all the edges of the panels. Some of these will be used to bring the case together, while others are for attaching the face frame, which you'll see later. And after sanding all of the pieces, it's time to put the case together. I used one of the bottom stretchers as a spacer to help me position the bottom panel to the side panel before I fasten them together with glue and screws. Then I just repeated the same process to attach the rest of the panels together for this base cabinet. Instead of me trying to explain each step, I think this animation would make things much clearer. What's great about using pocket screws is that once the screws are in, I could pretty much immediately take the clamps off and start on the next step, which is attaching the stretchers. And you can do this in any order you like, but I started by attaching the bottom stretchers that were used as spacers in the previous steps. Then I flipped the whole assembly over onto its feet and attached the top horizontal stretchers connecting the two side panels to the vertical partition. And instead of using a full back panel, I opted for one long stretcher that spans across the side panels to bring everything together. After assembling the second base cabinet off camera using the exact same process as the first, it was time to start making the face frames. So as a small furniture maker, my first instinct was to cut each frame piece individually to fit the panel that they're going on. But this will most likely cause problems as we bring the two base cabinets together because any small variations in the pieces will compound over the length of the cabinets. And these errors will likely cause me to end up with drawer openings that won't line up perfectly. 
So the conventional way is to actually construct the face frame separately. That way all the joints will be nice and tight, everything's squared up, and all the openings are the same size. Then you take that and attach it to the case. This way you'll end up with a perfect frame on a not so perfect case, but you know what? That won't matter because it'll give the illusion that everything's perfect and let's be honest, that's all the client will really care about. I'm going to use dominoes to attach the frame pieces, but you can also use pocket screws, biscuits, dowels, or whatever you want. We just want something here to keep the parts aligned and the joints tight. And since these pieces aren't very big, each joint will only receive one domino, but for this application, I think one's enough. I use clamping squares in the corners to hold the parts at a right angle, while I squeeze the joints closed with clamps. Keep in mind not to apply too much pressure on these since the rails really aren't that big. We don't want to introduce any kind of deformation or flushness problems between the parts. The next day, I took the face frames out of the clamps and gave everything a quick sanding to knock down any glue squeeze out that might interfere with how the frame will sit on the case before attaching them together. I used clamps to prevent things from slipping around while I drove screws through the pocket holes that we cut in the panels earlier. Once the face frames are attached, I place the cabinets next to each other and clamp them together to take measurements for the bench top, which will be made with a single piece of 3 quarter inch ply for the main top panel and several skeleton pieces attached along the bottom for added support. Using my track saw, I flushed up all the edges and cut the bench top to its final dimensions before cutting and attaching some hard maple trim around the two edges of the bench top that will not be sitting against walls. The bench top will actually sit about 1 inch proud of the base cabinets along the two edges with the edge banding applied to give the whole thing a little bit more depth. And here in this shot, you can see how all of that will come together. Alright, with the bench and bar table done, now it's time to work on the upper portion, which consists of a back wall with French cleats sandwiched between two identical side walls. Since the left side wall will sit flush to the bar top while also functioning as its secondary support, that is what I worked on next. And like the bar top, these side walls are made by laminating two pieces of 3 quarter inch plywood together with hard maple trim applied along what will be the top and front edges. These were pretty straightforward, so I'll jump right to how the side walls will attach to the bench top. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it's important to be able to assemble everything quickly and efficiently on install day. So bolts going through the bottom of the bench top into the bottom edge of the top walls was the way to go for me. But I didn't want to put threaded inserts directly into the plywood edge because I was worried it'll split the layers. What I'd end up doing was drilling 3 quarter inch holes in the locations where I'll be putting the threaded inserts, and then cut some dowel plugs to fill those holes. That way the threaded inserts will be actually embedded into the dowel which I guess in my mind will be a much more robust way to hold the inserts. So I've been using the centering jig that Woodpecker sent me, which made it really easy to keep the threaded inserts lined up down the middle of the part and perfectly normal to the surface. Later on, this will make it a lot easier to locate and drill the through holes for the bolts in the bench top. But of course, you know, if you don't have this jig, it's totally fine. If things are off a little, you could always oversize the through holes in the bench top to account for that deviation. But in my case, since the inserts were centered, all I had to do was transfer that center line of the wall panel to the bench surface, and then lay the panel down on its side to finalize the position of the through holes before drilling them. Mm -hmm. 
And in this shot, you can also see I added a couple of 3 8 inch dowels to the bottom, which will act as locating pins to help me quickly position the wall panel to the bench top before tightening everything down. Which, you know, it's a lot easier than trying to find the hole with one hand while maneuvering the panel with the other on install day. And then I just took a measurement in between them to determine the size of the back wall and, well, you guessed it, broke down more plywood. The construction of the back panel is pretty much the same as the bench top. There will be supports glued on the back of the panel along all four edges as well as a few along the middle. But the hardwood trim will only need to be applied along the top edge. So I used the same exact method to attach the back wall to the bench top as I did for the side walls. But I needed a different method to fasten all three walls together since I don't want bolts visible on the side of the bench. That's why I went with pocket screws placed along the short edges of the back wall. So the idea is I will attach all three walls to the bench first using bolts and then I'll come back and drive the pocket screws in to pull all three walls together. Next, I cut three strips for the French cleats that'll go on the back wall. And usually, I wouldn't put edge banding on something like this, but considering that these will all be below eye level, I really didn't want to leave the plywood edges bare, especially since these are walnut. So once those strips were cut to size, I spaced them evenly on the wall and attached them using glue and screws countersunk into the cleats. The shelves that will hang on these are actually pretty big and heavy, so I certainly was not stingy on the number of screws used. But that also meant I had a lot of holes to plug up. Fortunately though, I got this really cool tool from Tools Today. It's a plug planer, which I didn't even realize existed before this. This thing flushed up those plugs really fast and was actually kind of fun to use. But of course, I could have just as easily cut these using a flush trim saw. Maybe not as fast, but done the same job. Afterwards, I put the pieces together off camera and connected the bar top to the side wall using these steel brackets. This will allow the client the option to remove the bar table from the rest of the assembly if they needed to. And with that, all the major pieces for the build was pretty much complete. So I went over all the edges with a 1 16th inch roundover bit and sanded all the surfaces up to 220 grit to prep for finish. Since this piece will be in a commercial setting where the floor is cleaned with bleach and hot water every night, I needed a really tough finish. After talking to a few maker friends on Instagram, they all recommended conversion varnish, which I later found out could only be applied by spraying. So I went out and bought an HVLP system. Basically, this project gave me the little nudge I needed to get into spraying, and this process was actually really simple and quick, other than the fact that I had to pitch up a tent in my garage. But the finish went on so smooth and quick, and I honestly don't even want to think how long this would have taken me or how messy it would have been if I used some kind of wiping finish. After the finish had cured, I remembered I had to attach strips of plywood to the inside faces of the base cabinets so that the face frames won't interfere with the travel of the drawer slides later on. And then I proceeded with making the drawer boxes, which consists of sides made from half inch plywood with quarter inch bottoms. And since all the drawer openings are exactly the same, this process was really quick and painless, just lots of repeated cuts.
And now onto the drawer front. So for something like this, I really like the frame and panel look. Uh, but instead of using the traditional construction where a quarter inch thick panel sits in the grooves of a three quarter inch frame, I built these drawer fronts using half inch panel that sits in rabbits cut in the back side of the styles and rails. This allows the frame and panel to be flush in the back where it's mounted to the drawer boxes, but still keep the quarter inch reveal in the front. And up to this point, you've just been watching me mill the frame pieces four square before cutting them down to their final size. Now while there are several ways to attach the frame pieces such as using dominoes or pocket screws, I ended up going with a lap joint by cutting rabbits on both ends of the styles. One thing to note here is to make sure that the styles are actually long enough to use this method because the nesting will reduce the overall size of the drawer fronts. Glue and clamps alone are more than sufficient to assemble the frame, but I kind of wanted to get things moving along, so I shot some brad nails into the joints and proceeded with measuring and cutting the half inch panels. Since I'm using plywood for these, I didn't really feel the need to worry about expansion and contraction, so I just glued the panels in place and shot a few more brad nails to hold everything together. Although at this point, the drawer fronts are actually ready to be attached to the drawer boxes, I decided to wait until after the base cabinets are installed on site before doing that. So the next day, I began to work on the two large French cleat shelves instead, which I previously mentioned are actually really big and heavy, at least bigger than what I've done before. One was 47 inches long and the other was about 30 inches long, but both were 18 inches deep and made from 3 quarter inch ply. So because of this depth, I wanted good vertical support on both from the front to back. So I ended up making these side braces and added a taper to them to make them appear a little bit less chunky. These braces also has another function, and by attaching them to the outside of the assembly, I was able to hide all of the plywood edges from the side view without needing to apply any additional edge banding. To keep a large heavy shelf like this level and secure, I attached a spacer to each of the shelves just below the French cleat. Finally, I finished the shelves by attaching a strip of solid wood trim to the front of both shelves. And with that, the build was complete and ready to be installed. Since this building uses steel studs, which are thin and skinny, I decided to attach some cleats to the walls using anchors first, and then mount everything to those cleats. I think the part of the install that took the longest was using shims to bring the two base cabinets level and plumb, because once that's done, I just had to drill screws through the side of the face frames to bring them together, then screw them into the cleats mounted to the walls earlier. Once the base cabinets were secured, I began putting together the top, which pretty much went as planned, with the three walls bolted to the bench top first before they're secured to each other with pocket screws. And then all of that will get screwed to the cleats mounted to the walls as well as to the base cabinets. And once the drawers were in place and looking good, I went around the piece with caulk and sealed all the gaps to finish everything off.
This was definitely the biggest piece I have ever built, and although none of it was actually difficult, I did have to learn a few new skills and step out of my comfort zone and change the way I normally approach a build like this. But one thing's for sure, I am really glad I'm done with this piece and probably not going to build anything this large again anytime soon. Alright, once again, this is Alex from Bevelish Creations. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you guys next time.